Hello, my name is John McGrath. I'm a producer here at TVO, and uh, today we're talking about the Ring of Fire, one of the major uh, mining developments in uh, Canada and, and one of the largest in, uh, prospective one in Ontario's northwest. I'm speaking today with Josh Yarderson, Vice President of Policy and Government Relations at the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. Josh, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so uh, earlier this week, uh, the agenda was in Thunder Bay, uh, speaking in part about the Ring of Fire and what it means for that region. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, as coincidence, a happy coincidence, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce released a report uh, about the state of development in the Ring of Fire. Uh, first of all, just if you could give us a bit of a sense of what the Ring of Fire is and, and what does it mean for that region. Well, the Ring of Fire is a massive mineral deposit, uh, primarily chromite, chromium, uh, but there are other metals as well. And it is a uh, huge potential. It, it, we calculate that easily in the first uh, 10 years of its development, around $10 billion in new economic activity, uh, and lots of residual spin-off effects, uh, you know, big value in terms of government revenues. We predict that within 10 years, government is going to earn about $2 uh, $2 billion actually from the development through royalties, et cetera. Um, the issue with the Ring of Fire is that it's, it's, it's quite remote. It's about 300 kilometers from the nearest road. Um, but it can be transformational. Um, it can be uh, a catalyst for infrastructure development in the region. Uh, it can be a catalyst for infrastructure for um, you know, in terms of roads, transmission lines to First Nations communities, et cetera. So it could be uh, quite transformational. And the impact, of course, goes much beyond Northern Ontario, and that's actually the point of our report to demonstrate that this isn't just a Northern Ontario play. This is a whole of Ontario play. Uh, we talk a bit about the, the potential of the Ring of Fire, but it seems mm -hmm. like in the last few years that's all we've been able to talk about is mm -hmm. the potential. Uh, your report gives uh, everyone involved uh, an F grade in accelerating mm -hmm. uh, the Ring of Fire. Uh, why the bad marks? Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's always tough to give someone a bad mark. Um, you know, it hurts us in many ways more than it hurts them. I mean, the, the reality is, is, is uh, progress has been stalled. I mean, there is basically a de facto moratorium on environmental assessments in the region. Uh, Noront, which is the really the only you know substantial mining presence uh, that's ready to go, that is, there are others, but uh, has been waiting for its terms of reference for CEA to be approved um, for 130 weeks, something like that, and the province has a statutory commitment to around being 12 weeks. So, you know, we're quite concerned at the, the really the snail's pace. Um, and our concern really stems from the fact that, you know, um, capital is, is chasing opportunity. And if, if there are no clear timelines around the project, if there's no clear, that the capital will go elsewhere. And this, this could be a huge opportunity that passes us by. Uh, in fact, the largest company in the region, uh, mm -hmm. Cliffs Natural Resources, basically abandoned all of its plants for the Ring of Fire yeah. uh, last year, and that may not have entirely been uh, due to uh, the Ring of Fire. There was also some internal stuff at Cliffs that went on, but yeah. the, the CEO there has been quoted as saying he doesn't think that the Ring of Fire is going to be developed for a generation, I believe. Um, what, uh, what light do you see at the end of the tunnel? Well, you know, I mean, I think he was expressing frustration uh, around, for example, some of the public policy barriers that exist. Um, but the reality is the business case for the Ring of Fire is very much intact. Although there's, uh, you know, there's downturns in commodity prices, uh, um, the, the primary commodities that are in the Ring of Fire, actually the price, prices have remained robust. And, and so it, the growth projections are well, I mean, uh, as well are, are fairly robust. We expect the increased in demand for stainless steel, for example. So that's good news for the Ring of Fire. Um, I, I think you know, we see light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, and that's why we're out there. I mean, we're, we're, we sort of see ourselves as the, you know, as the gnat fly, you know, biting the butts of government and the key players to try to get them to uh, uh, hurry up, if you will. Um, you know, there's, you know, we're not saying that, you know, you can wave a magic wand in two years from now, everything's, you know, be, you know all the mines will be open, et cetera, et cetera. But there are real tangible incremental steps that we can take. One, lift the ban on, or lift the moratorium on permitting, get one mine per permitted. That's a step. Uh, a second step is let's land an infrastructure plan. Let's uh, land a plan that you know produces the economic benefits, but also the social benefits. Let's figure out how, you know where the road is going to go, what the road is going to look like, what communities is going to touch. Um, you land a plan, and uh, and you uh, permit a mine, and you get a federal commitment, a hard federal commitment around dollars. You 
that's momentum, and that's all achievable within a year. Uh, we want to definitely talk about infrastructure, but sure. uh, when we talk about getting a, a first mine permitted, we're basically talking about Noron's Eagle's Nest mine. They're the right. only ones who are even close to getting uh, the, the doors on a mine actually open. Is that correct? That's correct, yep. Uh, is, is, is getting one mine in, a, in the scale of things a relatively small mine? Uh, is, I, I know you talk about building momentum, but is that realistically going to change the, 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 the perspective on these things? It does. I think, I mean, it, it, it does. And again, it's an incremental step. It's not a magic wand, but I mean, uh, Noront is ready to go. And, uh, you know, they've contributed to a program, an education program um, aimed at uh, the First Nations communities in, in the region. They have 400 graduates out of that program with the skills that they can utilize uh, to help get this project going. And, and it's a shame if you know we're graduating people, if we're creating the human capital, and, 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 and the opportunities aren't existing, right? In terms of that infrastructure plan, uh, most of the last year seemed to be wasted in fighting between Ottawa and Queen's Park over who was going to pay, how much were they going to pay. Yeah. We've seen a bit of a thawing in the relationship. Uh, yeah. is, is that something you hope to see built on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, certainly intergovernmental bickering does nobody any good. Uh, what I would say, though, is you know the federal government has a history of investing in these, you know, large economic, tr you know, economic transformational projects, right? Uh, you think of the oil sands, and the federal government was an early player in the oil sands. You think of Churchill Falls, the large hydro project in Newfoundland. The federal government has stepped up for those, and I think that, you know, we're we're advocating uh, a similar type of treatment. And and I mean, our big big concern is that Ontario's infrastructure needs are are massive, right? Uh, and if, if we allocate money out of the pool dedicated to federal Ontario's infrastructure, we're just diverting away from other priorities. And so we're looking at this as an opportunity for the federal government to step up outside of the normal infrastructure, you know, pockets that are, are, are could be other, you know, used elsewhere or are very much needed elsewhere. And of course, when we, we talk about infrastructure, mm -hmm. the reality is that the Ring of Fires, as you've mentioned, it, it is in the middle of a region that where we're primarily talking about serving uh, First Nations communities. There's been a lot of talk about uh, not just roads, but your report also mentions uh, electrical infrastructure and yeah. fiber optic data infrastructure as well. Yeah. Do we have any sense, I know there's at least one company that has uh, moved forward with the Ontario Power Authority about wiring up some of these remote First Nations communities. Mm -hmm. Do we have any sense of how fast that could happen? Um, I don't. I mean, uh, I mean, in this area, this is an area that I'm not necessarily an expert, but I've talk, we've talked to over 60 individuals um, uh, in drafting the report and getting their views, et cetera, and they're, you know, the, it seems to be fairly universal out there that we're not talking about just a road. We're actually talking a whole suite of infrastructure services that should be developed in tandem and parallel, too. Um, we know that getting many of these communities off diesel is a priority. It's an environmental priority. It's also, you know, it's, 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 uh, um, so my sense is, is that when we develop these plans, we have to develop them in tandem. I mean, and we have to develop them incrementally in the sense that, you know, we, we uh, uh, is going to take time. And, and, but I think certainly, um, looking at one of the things we're suggesting is that there is potential hydroelectric development up there. Mm -hmm. Uh, and maybe looking at doing a feasibility study around, uh, creating. And we also know the Trans Canada, the Energy East project, will also flow through the region. And so they're going to have they're going to have electrification needs. So what then is a solution? So, but I, I guess the core point here is that we are talking about the complete infrastructure package, not just a road. And that road cannot be the short, you know, just the shortest possible route to the mine. We know that it's going to have to create opportunities and, and touch the communities that are surrounding the region as well. So this isn't just an economic play; it's also a, a really a massive social policy project as well. Uh, the government has repeatedly referred to the Ring of Fire as something that could be, you know, as large or larger than the Sudbury and, and Timmins mm -hmm. plays uh, back in their day. Uh, is this, uh, are we seeing a, a possible new age for Northwestern Ontario here? Possibly. I mean, so our, our, our numbers tell us that, and, and, and people say that we're wildly conservative. So we say, you know, within 32 years, about $25 billion in economic activity. That is truly transformational. Um, and of course, the largest beneficiaries will be the you know the communities that are closest and the communities that already have critical mass and mining supplies and mining services, etc. Um, but yeah, it can be quite transformational. And and you know the the deposits that are known 
to exist now are just, you know, are, are, are the junior miners and the prospectors are telling us it's just the tip of the iceberg. So it, it, it potentially could be. Uh, and it's not just the Ring of Fire as well. I mean, you know, the Ring of Fire is a, is, is a particular, you know, region within, and, you know, you build the road and you're going to create all sorts of other opportunities that are, you know, uh, adjacent to the Ring of Fire as well. So it, tr it truly could be a, a, a transformational game-changing play for Ontario, which is really important because we know that other struggle, other sectors of the economy are struggling. We know that, you know, uh, um, we know that we need to find areas where we can be globally competitive. We need to invest and concentrate our resources, and truly, mining is one. Okay, uh, that's all we've got time for today. Uh, Josh Yarderson uh, with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much.